there, there was this notion, uh, which is quoted by Father Bernardino as uh, superstitions, uh, that's what they call them, Ted Sawit and so forth, they make these dreams and so forth. And the snake is associated with the idea of, of, of two, because this notion that a snake traveled with its, its, uh, its uh, couple, its pair. If you were walking along uh, a, a, a road and you came across a snake, the warning was beware because you know, its partner is right around the corner. So that's the notion. Um, also, the forked tongue, apparently there are some snakes that have, but uh, male, the male has two penises and so forth. So it's tied to the idea of two-ness, right, of, of duality. I think that the word koat was first and foremost applied to the idea of two, or pair, or twin. And because the snake itself was viewed as coming in twos, then it was applied to snake. Why do I say that? I base it strictly on the following. If you examine the word koat in Nahuatl and how it entered Mexican Spanish, it comes in only as twin, things that go together, buddy, friend, and so forth. It does not come in a snake. There's only one example that I have come across in Mexican Spanish, and it's not the word coat by itself. It's a compound. Pichicuate. Have you heard of pichicuate? It's a slender snake. Pichicoat. But it doesn't come in by itself. Coat as snake. It's, it's compound. Every other example of cuate in Spanish has the original notion of the Nahuatl. It's almost cuates. That doesn't necessarily mean we're twins, right? It means what? Thank you, we hang out together, right? We hang out together. So that has anything to do with duality? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. The idea of two-ness, right? Or, or things that go together. Right? I, I think you can translate caught as, as a row, I think as a bunch, as a group, that sort of thing. Another one, mis caught, mis caught. You know what it means? Think of the early diction. Even today in Emilpa Alta, mis caught refers to what? A whirlwind. It refers to a hurricane sometimes, a thunderstorm. Mis caught. Cloud snake? No, I'm sorry. Mish, cloud, koat, a bunch of clouds there, right? That's the idea. Yeah, please. Uh, in the beginning, you um, mentioned that now it means clear speech, and I've always seen it written for waters. Could you break down the etymology of that? Yeah, at is water for sure. But uh, if you want to say for water, the word for four is nawi. You know, well, you know that for sure, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, nawi at. Now we at, right? Uh, some, the stem of, of, of uh, nouns that end in we or wheat is always uh. So she, we, she, you, tell she, we, tell you. Now we always occurs as now. Now. So if you're, if you're counting, if you're counting, depending on what you're counting, if you're counting smooth objects and so forth, you put the word tet at, begin, at the end. So one, let's say, stone would be sen tet, on tet, yet tet, and then four. Now that N A U H, so that's the stem. Now Kali, right? For Kali, or you could say Nawi Kali. Uh, so, if you want to say for water, it'd be Nau At or Nawi At, but not Na What. And could you say that maybe Na What comes from Nau At or from Nawi At? Everything is possible. My own. Uh, opinion is the following. Since Nawa occurs as the stem of Nawa, it, it already is a stem, Nawa. So I don't think it can derive from Nau or Nawi because they occur independently on their own. Uh, I, I, I'd say reducible to me. I don't know. Not, uh, we just simply know that it refers to that. Yeah. And, and you do find it in words such as Nawali, which is like a spirit, right? Nowadays, again, it's the animal into which someone is supposedly able to, to be transformed. Um, does this word sound familiar to you? Zea? Z E I A? Z E I A. Because of my, no. uh, my, my brother and my sister in law named one of their kids Zea, and they saw it um, in the Nahuatl dictionary, and it said it means strength, but maybe it's a different like a dialect. It could be a different variety of Nahuatl, but I'm not familiar with it. Say. But say I like just like that, no TL at the end? No, Z E I A. Supposedly no. it means strength. Or strength. Generally, nouns end in TL. Not, not all of them. You have Chichi that does not, and Ilama, which does not. Uh, but generally, in T, TL, put it on uh, TLI, 
L I or, or I N. Yeah, uh, some, some of the stuff that comes from contemporary now, it's kind of like the uh, Mexica Tiawi. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Said, sure. Because right. you can look up Tiawi and yeah, you're not going to find it right, in exactly. any dictionary. Yeah, right. So, wait, what does that mean? I'm sorry? What does, uh, Michigan, yeah, what it's like, let's Mexicans up, you know, adelante, that sort of thing, you know. Any other, any other thing before? Okay. You said, you said that one and a half million people speak now. Is it more? Or is it more? No, it's, you know, I, that's really tricky because I find the situation of Nahuatl speakers, it's a little better now, but, you know, analogous to the situation of Spanish speakers here in the U.S. in the 1940s and 50s. When I was growing up, most people did not want to admit that they spoke Spanish. As a matter of fact, our parents didn't want their kids to speak Spanish. And, and it's a reaction to the situation. I mean, I was never punished for speaking Spanish in school, but we were threatened with that. And, and, and adults didn't, didn't want to, to speak Spanish. I'm, I'm talking about the population you know, that had been here for, for generations. And um, a lot of people pronounce their surnames uh, a la gabacha, as we would say, you know. Martinez and Lopez and Garcia, which is fine, you know. If you like the way it sounds, it's fine. But if you do it out of embarrassment, well, that's not fine. <laughs> uh, and now what speakers, uh, Mayan speakers and so forth, have been in the same situation. They don't want to admit that they speak, uh, they speak uh, Nahuatl or, or Mayan or Zapotec. Even uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and it's historically, it's, it's been that way since the arrival of, of the Spaniards. Uh, the term mestizo is a perfect way out for a lot of people. I have some friends who speak Purépecha and they're musicians and I ask them, how did you learn how to sing these songs in Purépecha? That's the language of Michoacán. And they said, well, nuestros padres son indígenas. The implication, we're not, like we're not, you know. <laughs> you know but that's the implication. And I, I, I always give this example also, Ignacio Manuel Altamirano, anyone familiar with him? Mexican romantic writer of the 19th century? He became a very famous journalist in Mexico City and then eventually a writer of short stories and novels and really Mexico's most uh, popular writer of romantic literature. He didn't speak a word of Spanish until he was 16. He was a native Nahuatl speaker. But once he became famous, then hablaba de los indios, right? <laughs> That's the idea. So I think a lot of people don't want to admit that they speak Nahuatl. And I have a friend, he's a musician, also speaks Nahuatl from, from Veracruz. And he always claimed that his mother was uh, Española. Because from a small town in, Vera, in Veracruz, Xochocapa, you know, Xochocapa, as they say. And, you know, I, 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 I pinned him down on that once. And I asked, you know, ¿tu mamá viene de España? No, no, no. ¿Y tu papá, eh, dónde la conoce? Aquí, aquí, aquí. And I, well, I finally figured out that she was one of the few people in the town who spoke uh, some words in Spanish. So they called her La Española. <laughs> so... <laughs> Let's say that, that you and your neighborhood, you know, knew a few words in French, you know, and they called you Frenchy, you know, and, and now your, your kids say that you're, my dad's a, is, a, is, is Francais, no? It's the same thing, you know, but it's, it's a way out, it's a way out. I, I was on my way one time from Mexico City to Tula, and I saw this guy extracting pulque um, from the Maguey. So I stopped by, I was in Nueva Vendia, and... Uh, I guess I was profiling, but I assume being so near that place that he spoke Nahuatl, so um, I was curious about what he called the burro. You know? uh, and uh, so I asked him, you know, I said, clay toca inon yokat. What is that animal called? Burro. <laughs> <laughs> but he would not, he would not utter a word in Nahuatl. He just wouldn't. He wouldn't. And, I, and I, I didn't want to embarrass him either, but some people are still embarrassed. So if a million and a half, I think it's more than that. I was just looking at some figures the other day from the Instituto Nacional Indigenista. I think it's over two million or so. Those are the ones who are willing to admit that they speak. They speak now. I, I feel it's much more. How about you?